Thanks. Thank you all for coming out. It's wonderful to see you all here in this lovely, uh, sunny uh, Fairfield evening. I'm still stuck in summer. So this is going to be the uh, portion of the evening uh, in which uh, our minority candidates uh, get to have a quick opening statement for all of you and then uh, take questions. The questions are all going to come from the floor. We want it to be as open as possible in terms of involving all of you people uh, who've come to participate in this event. And uh, we have a timekeeper, uh, Mr. Rick Schwartz, right here in the front. And he has got uh, three cards, a green, a yellow, and a red. And, and the timekeeper is for the candidates, not for yourselves. Uh, we'll explain the questioning process in a moment, but basically the three cards, one of them uh, indicates that the candidate is halfway through his allotted time. That's the one that says half on it. The other one is yellow and indicates that the candidate has 10 seconds left in which to wrap up, and then there's a red one or a pink, hot pink one indicating your time is done. So I hope that works well for the candidates. Good, so we'll describe the uh, question and answer process in a moment, but right now we're very pleased to uh, uh, offer the uh, three candidates for mayor, for, for mayor of the City of Victoria an opportunity to give us a two-minute opening statement. We've done this in terms of the, uh, the order as a, a drawing of lots. And our first candidate to speak is Dean Fortin. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak to you tonight. I will uh, start by recognizing that we do meet on the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. Aichika, welcome. Welcome to this. Over the past three years, uh, it has been my great honor and pleasure to serve as mayor, and I'm here seeking your support for a second term. Together, we have made Victoria a much more caring and sustainable city. We've built more affordable and supportive housing units. We've improved transit. We have improved parks and revitalized green spaces. We've brought in and have a strong, diversified green economy. Together, we have made Victoria safer and more vibrant. Here are some of our priorities for the next three years. Affordable housing. We have made great strides over the last three years with our partners in the Coalition and Homelessness. We've helped house more than 1,500 people. Together, we've helped create more almost 800 units of supportive housing, housing for the hard to house, housing for families, housing for seniors. We want to make sure that we continue the role and end that job. Secondly, we looked at revitalizing our parks and public spaces. We've worked hard to make sure our downtown is vibrant and active over the last three years. We have decreased um, social disorder by 26%. We want to make sure that we keep rolling on that. We also built the most inclusive and transparent city hall that Victoria has ever seen. And we want to take this initiative further with our open government through open data initiative. There's many more opportunities that I want to talk to you about what we can do as we move forward in the future to make sure that people can afford to live here from scooters to, um, uh, from scooters, uh, to uh, strollers. We want to make sure that Victoria is a place for everyone to live here, uh, for families where people can start a job, start a business, start a career. I look forward to the next three years working with you to make sure that we can continue to have an open, caring Victoria, one where everyone can afford to live. Thank you. Next, Mr. Paul Brown. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Brown, and I'm running to be the next mayor of the city of Victoria, and I'm running on a slate called Open Victoria. Give you a little bit of background. For the last 25 years, I've been providing financial, procurement, risk, and performance governance to the highest levels of the public service uh, in provincial, state, and territorial governments across the Pacific Northwest. I will tell you, I have no political affiliations. My decisions will be based upon sound judgment, due diligence. Over the last 10 months, I've been pretty much working full-time researching the city's financial and non-financial affairs. Together with my colleagues on Open, uh, on Open Victoria, we want to change the way the city does business, and we think it's important to do that. Let me speak to three things. First of all, more decisions need to be made in front of the public. We've got to stop making decisions behind closed doors. We've seen too many surprises, whether it be the John... Whether, it's we, whether it be the Johnson Street Bridge or the recent revelation that the Crystal Pool and the Fire Hall are not in shape. We can't afford to be surprised again. 
Second, we need to focus Council's attention on the issues that are most important to this city. Too much time at Council is being spent on insignificant issues, miniature goats. We need to focus on the issues that really count to this city. The city's finances, its infrastructure, it's crumbling, services are being cut, downtown is deteriorating. We've got to deal with those. And one of those issues is the city's finances. Dean Fortin will tell you we're well off financially. I will tell you, this city is in tough financial shape. It is not sustainable. Dean speaks of a sustainable government. This is not a financially sustainable situation we are in. We can fix it. We've got to fix it. I will fix it. Open Victoria will fix it. Thank you. Steve Filipovic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Steve Filipovic, and I'm running for Mayor of Victoria to provide you with a real, genuine opportunity to get real change here in Victoria. I'm a small business owner running Filipovic Residential Services for the past 25 years, so I've been working in and around Victoria, serving Victorians for a long time. Uh, I focus on fences and decks through the summertime, and I do renovation work through the wintertime. So I know housing costs, and I know that we're paying far too much for our housing costs here in Victoria, and we need to be addressing that. I'm also a community advocate working with um, activist groups here in Victoria. Um, the, the, the largest um, contribution I've done is my work through Earthwalk. For the past 15 years, we've been organizing an annual event here in Victoria, which has a participatory parade and an environmental fair, which showcases 30 to 40 different environmental groups here in Victoria. Now, this has given me a deep understanding of all the issues that we're facing, and it helped me win the Monday um, Magazine Award for Mayor in 2008. I've run twice before in municipal elections, coming in uh, third both times. So I need your help to get past the big money teams that dominate our local politics. So that's the real change that I'm trying to offer. Common sense has been missing from Victoria for too long. I will work to reinstall it as the main mechanism for problem solving. I will create several access points to relevant information and stimulate debate about directions to pursue. I will fund the community centres to a level enabling them to facilitate genuine community building initiatives and I will create dignity villages for those who have been left out in the cold for too long. I will shift the spending of our $200 million annual budget toward those changes this community has been in need of for quite some time. I will make sure that all those shifts are done in an open and accountable manner in the light of day and with plenty of time for everyone to chime in. I will place more demands on those in leadership roles of the city and supply more support for the workers who provide the results. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I, I should mention that my name is Sid Taffler, uh, just to know, you know who I am. Um, now, just, just keep, can I have a show of hands? If you have a question you'd like to ask the candidates right now, perhaps one will occur to you later on, but anybody who does, please raise their hand. I have indication, that's terrific. Okay, thank you very much. So the questions will all come from the floor. I don't really see a need to line up at the mic. I think you can stay in your, in your seats. If you'd like to use the mic, if you don't have a good, strong voice, please do. There is a mic over there. If you feel comfortable in this fairly small room, just standing and asking your question quite vigorously for all of us to hear, that's okay too. So uh, we'll, we'll take questions uh, and uh, basically we're gonna allow, you could address your question to a specific candidate, that's fine. Uh, and that candidate will have two minutes to respond to your question. And then the other candidates can choose. Do they also wish to respond? And if they do, they'll have 90 seconds, a little bit less than what we're calling rebuttal. And then uh, we'll try to work it out so every candidate gets to speak first a number of times. So it's, you know, even if you don't ask your question directly to, you know, we'll work that out somehow, I think. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we can start at any time. And uh, all I'm going to suggest as well is that the questions be of, of a nature of civic government. That's what we're, we're discussing tonight. There are many other issues, but that's really the kind of uh, authority the mayor has is to deal with civic issues. Um, so, um, Rick, again, will keep time. And uh, I'm certainly willing to, to take the first question. Anybody, that gentleman over there. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a gentleman in the back. You'll be next, sir. Uh, this is for all the members there. Okay. Um, if you're elected mayor, will you support the community plans? Many of the community plans have the following. 
protect heritage homes, protect green spaces and trees, and preserve the residential areas of the community. Community plans were originally developed to give local citizens a voice in what they wanted in the area that they lived. So it's more bottom up the input than top down. So I would appreciate each candidate to comment on supporting the plan. Who would like to take that first? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Ford? Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, and it is a good question, and it's one of the things that we've worked really hard on over the last three years. As you know, we've been working on the official community plan. One of the things that's been really remarkable this year is we've had more than 6,000 people involved in building that plan, uh, going to talk to classes in, in stadiums at uh, UVic where we had 600 young people involved. We had mocktails down at the uh, conference center. We went out to malls. We were everywhere talking to people to see how they saw the future of their city in the next 30 years. What we heard from people a lot is that we wanted us to focus on the villages and on the cores. So we honor the community plans that exist, recognize that there's transportation plans within those, but where change is going to happen is around the village cores. Everybody wants a livable, walkable city. What does that mean for the villages? And so that's the next piece of work that we go out and start talking with directly to the community, building it with you. I think it's important to understand what the role civic government does play though. As you build community plans and you to do the zoning, but it's an understanding that as a private property owner, you have the right to apply, and as a city government is you must consider. It doesn't mean you grant it. It does mean that you have to consider someone who applies for rezoning. And your goal, is, uh, your op goal as City of Victoria uh, municipal leaders is to say, does this application fit within what the community is trying to do? Does it reflect and, and, and is it going to accomplish what you want within the city within it? So does it reflect the spirit and not necessarily the letter of the law? That's your responsibility as a government. You don't just come in and say, here's the community plan. We will not hear any applications for the next 30 years and nothing moves or changes. You have that responsibility and you cannot refuse uh, to hear someone's application. Doesn't mean you grant it. It means you must give them fair hearing. And that's the responsibility of all governments. Thank you. Um, I'm all for a bottom-up government uh, because we should be responding to the needs of the people. So part of my platform is to invest in community centers, give them more staffing and resources so they can reach their community. We have a crisis here in Victoria and I think it's a crisis across BC, where a very small people are, um, a very small number of people are participating in our local elections. And here in Victoria, it's one in four. So this is a, um, a real catastrophe. And I think that we can challenge that by in reinvesting in our community centers so they can have more resources for their community plan. And when their population gets behind an idea, they can just bring it to City Hall and then we'll help facilitate that through. So I'm all for community centers and I, I know that a lot of especially in Vic West, I've been talking to people there, and they were saying that their community plan has not been honored and they want it to be um, put in place and respected more. So I think that's, that's the kind of thing we need to do and we can do that by reinvesting in our community centers and, um, and trying to be more open to what, what the communities are directing City Hall to do. Thank you. Well, let me first of all speak to the official community plan. Tremendous amount of effort put into it. Very detailed document. I, uh, I wonder whether it is too detailed. Um, rather thick, to say the least. But no money to implement it. And like so many other plans that this city develops, and I can go through half a dozen to a dozen of them. Developed plans, a lot of money goes into it. On the shelf they go. Why are we developing these plans if we're not going to put some money into implementation? So, uh, the official community plan, let's implement it, but I do have some reservations about it. As far as local area plans and neighborhood plans, they're old, they're dated, and they're never respected. They need to be respected. Why are we asking our communities to put all of this effort into developing these plans if we're not going to pay attention to them? I believe I'm done with half my time, but I've done with my full answer on that one. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here. follow-up question for that. Uh, my observation is the update of the official community plan project was blocked for the following reasons. Yeah. 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 Just, just a little louder, please. Just a little louder. Yeah. 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 Why don't you use this mic right here? Burke? Right here. Use this one. Right here.
the update of the official <laughs> Okay, well, it's probably better there. Is that better? The update of the official community plan project was flawed for the following reasons. It took almost seven years to complete from the 2005 Spaxman Group Report on Strategic Planning. It was a stunningly narrow scope project that updated only one of 50 related documents required for Council to make informed land use management decisions, including the, the 15 neighborhood plans and 20 generic plans that are now a quarter century old. Neighborhood plans have not been adopted by bylaw to bring them into line with other CRD municipalities. This is one example of the vague content of the OCP. The public meetings were an illusion of public participation as these and many other concerns were not addressed by the, yes, okay. Mayor Fortin and candidates, will you, if elected, review the project deficiencies and initiate a project to implement a 21st century automated land use management decision support system. Hey, any of the candidates like to take this one first? Well, you know, I, I mean, that, it, it, it's a fairly complicated question, to be honest with you. Um, as I say, I think there was a tremendous amount of effort that was put into the official community plan. Um, I wonder whether it has become too thick in nature, it's become overly prescriptive. I think the uh, local area plans and the neighborhood plans are the ones that, that really should get into that level of detail. But again, I go back to the fact that um, the city is so hard up for cash, there is no money to implement these plans. So what's the point of developing them if you don't have the cash to actually make them work? I would say that there's a long history of the city ignoring the um, desires of the population of Victoria. Uh, this has led to a, a real frustration in the population. We need an open and accountable government here in Victoria. It's a public office. It's your office. You should be able to access information when you want it, not have to go through a freedom of information officer and be barred from, from getting information. Um, you should have the, the, every single survey or study that the city pays for is your survey and study. You should have access to it so you can read it and find out what's been going on. This is the type of information that we need as citizens. Okay, we cannot make good decisions about our future if we don't know the facts. And we need the facts on the table before us all so we can hold our city um, hall more accountable. And that way if we know what's going on and the city is doing something wrong, we'll know early on. We won't have to play catch up or be three months behind what the city is actually doing. So we need to strive for that and it's gonna be a hard challenge. Uh, there's 47,000 non-voters out there, so do your best to wake some of them up and let's bring more accountable actions to this city, please. Thank you. I'm really excited about the document we got from our official community plan. It really was getting out there and talking to people. And I know that it took 18 months to do. And, and the interesting thing is we said, okay, everybody, here's the final draft. We want one last draft comment from everyone. And what we got was, is we got 300 extra comments. And staff came forward in the summer and said, well, Mr. Mayor, Council, you said that you wanted to get this done in 12 months, and, and we know that that was the interest that you wanted to have. Um, but really, let's, we want to honor those last 300 comments. And so we did. So we're taking a little bit longer to get it done. Because I think it's important when you say to people, we want to hear your voice, that you actually listen to that voice and make sure they get into the documents. And I recognize that some people don't like everything that's in that plan, but I think we need to respect the fact that that was build, built by consultation with the largest group of people we've ever seen in this city. And I think it's also important to understand that what the plan sets up is here's the direction, here's the zoning, and here's where we go. And there's opportunities for us to take advantage. So when redevelopment comes forward, we say, great, thank you very much for your redevelopment. You need to contribute funding towards the Harbor Pathway, or to greenways, or to bike lanes, or putting money towards uh, a parking infrastructure plan. So it isn't always about saying, here's the plan and you need to put the money in there. It's about setting up the opportunities that we can afford to bring all of those important things forward, but recognize how we're going to afford and pay for those. So that's important for us, and we think it's important. 
Uh, we have a question at the mic, please, and then that, this lady over here. Thank you. My name is Peter Pollan. I used to be the mayor of the city. For four terms, I was mayor of the city. And I might say on an increasing popularity, but it wasn't a popularity contest because I told everybody what I thought. I think this talk about community plans is a great fantasy. Let's concentrate on a day-to-day -day operation of the city. Right now, we're spending so damn much money, we're going to drive you people out of your homes. We don't get any income tax in the city, as you probably know. The income tax is federal and provincial. Where we base the operation of this government on home ownership taxes on their assessment, whether they can afford it or not. It's about time we started to think about expending money. And the biggest money right now is this Blue Bridge, 80 to $100 million for a Blue Bridge. It's a little city of Victoria. Not 25% not of the gross, uh, the, the gross uh, population of Greater Victoria. Do you have a question, sir, please? But, uh, but it's, it's uh, coming up. The, the bridge. <laughs> the bridge is, it, we've got this bridge, 80 to $100 million. I was about to make it, but you interrupted me. Sorry. <laughs> the, for, for seven years prior to the discovery that the bridge needed to be replaced, seven years. There was no maintenance on that bridge. When I was mayor, we spent two hundred to to $250,000 a year maintaining that bridge. All of a sudden, after seven years of no maintenance, it's discovered that the citizens of Victoria should build a new $100 million bridge. Would you like to question I think there's a conspiracy the bridge, in this, and I'd like to know what the, the present uh, mayor has got to say about it. OK, well, fine. Um, But the question is around the bridge, uh, and certainly uh, we're going in some kind of an order. Mr. Filipovic will have an opportunity to answer first, and then the mayor can, uh, the, the Mr. Uh, Fortin can answer after that. Well, as many of you will remember, I campaigned very diligently trying to get the $8.6 million bridge fix to be honored uh, for our bridge. I do believe that that bridge was left to be unmaintained for a long time, so it would look really bad so that the PR that the city is spinning could lead us into a new bridge. Uh, it's a very shameful situation. We have a, a very expensive PR team at City Hall. You don't need a PR team if you're telling the truth. You need a PR team if you're leading people somewhere they don't want to go. So it's, some, it's a big question you should all have. Why do we have such an expensive PR team in our public office standing between us and our real information? Okay. So I, I would do away with the PR team. Would you like to respond, Mr. Fort? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Paulin, and we respect you very much as, a, as an elder within our community. Thank you, sir. Um, I will say that uh, the Blue Bridge is $77 million. Uh, we were fortunate to get $21 million from the federal government, and we went out to referendum. Uh, and after getting all of the information out for the people, and the people chose uh, 62 to, to 38 uh, that they would like to see a new bridge come forward. Since that time, since that time, we've got another eight million dollars from the federal government, and we're waiting for another uh, eight million dollars. So right now, the cost to the citizens is about 41 million dollars. As any project, costs will move up in one area and down in the others. And our job is to make sure that we manage it within budget and make sure that we build a bridge for our next hundred years. And that's one we're excited about. I'm sorry, but um, there is no no spin and there's no shame. And anybody who says there's been no maintenance, uh, I just want to say that that's not true. It's incorrect. We do the maintenance. I'd love to take the opportunity to tell you more uh, about how difficult it is, uh, how the bridge was built, why it rots from the inside, and how you can't maintain that piece. But the outside maintenance, we kept it going as long as we can, and we appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to the community and neighbourhoods about that. Thank you. I'm not going to get into the maintenance area because, I, yeah, I do have questions around that. I'm not certain. I just want to say this. The whole Johnson Street Bridge process stunk, and it still stinks. 
something's wrong, it's foul. We're seeing reports coming out of Focus Magazine revealing new information. Too much is being done behind closed doors. I tend to agree with Steve. It's been a spin approach, a PR approach. Um, I want to take a real close look at those financial costs because I'm concerned this is gonna get out of hand. And I don't feel we should have had to pay the whole tab on that bridge. Now, Dean, yes, the federal government's throwing in, but anybody know about the Craig Flower Bridge? It's got to be replaced. And Saanich and View Royal came to the CRD and said, 10.8 million, we can't afford it. It's a regional transportation artery. And guess what? The CRD, including Mr. Fortin, voted to give them 10 million of the 10.8 through the gas tax. I asked Barb Desjardins and Esquimo, the mayor of Esquimo, why didn't Victoria get the same consideration in terms of that level of funding? She said, you know, want to know something? We don't know why. Victoria never asked. It's wrong. It stinks. We, you got to stand up for the city of Victoria and you haven't been standing up for this city. You seem to think you were elected the mayor of Greater Victoria. You are the mayor of Victoria. You should be standing up for Victoria. And I say the same with regard to the LRT. The LRT is not going to benefit our city. I'd like to give you an exact figure, but I'm having trouble getting exact figures out of City Hall. But I can tell you this, I can tell you this. In 2009, our debt in the City of Victoria, long-term debt, went up 13%. In Saanich, Oak Bay, and Esquimo, it went down approximately 10%. If I look at the budget documents this year for the City of Victoria, our debt carrying costs are going to go up 129%. Comes right out of your budget documents, Dean. I'm scared. Our debt on a per capita basis in Victoria is four times that of Saanich. We have every right to be scared because if this bridge gets out of line, we're in trouble. If we build an LRT and we go forward with a sewage treatment plant, we're going to gag. You want to talk about affordable housing? There ain't going to be any affordable housing in this city. We've got to deal with it. I don't want to paint bad news all around. We can deal with it if we pull together. But if we continue to ignore it, I'll tell you, we're in serious trouble. And we're approach approaching that very quickly right now. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, if you can, I want to address that question. Oh, sorry, I don't know exactly what the uh, debt of Victoria is, but I do know that there's a lot of um, infrastructure projects that are quite iffy, right? If you look at the $43 million new fire hall, in the report it says that in the case of a major earthquake, the brick facade on the front of the building will bury the trucks inside. Now, anybody with a wheelbarrow knows you can move a pile of bricks in 20 minutes. So why would we spend $43 million to avoid that? We could spend... $2,000 and have those bricks bolted on so they won't fall off. And that will save us $43 million. If you look at the crystal pool, they said in their report that the pool was only designed to last 20 years. Did we make it out of hay bales? I don't think so. That's a cement and steel building. It's going to last more than 20 years. It's going to last more than 40 years. It's going to last more than 80 years. Okay, I'm sure there's going to be issues with it. We can fix it up for a lot cheaper than $58 million. Okay, the Rock Bay building that they made for the hard to house, $500,000 per unit. That's the same as buying someone a house in Fernwood for every person in that building. If they had done that, they would have housed four times as many people. So we have to challenge the big money projects that our city's doing. They're ridiculous and we're on the hook for it.
Thank you. Uh, some quick clarification. The file hire upgrade is uh, $12 million. It's not 43. Uh, quick clarification. Uh, the Rock Bay project was paid for by BC Housing. Uh, it's a provincial initiative and it wasn't paid for by the City of Victoria. But I would say that we were proud partners to work with them to make sure that we could deliver those affordable housing and supportive housing that we needed to deal with homelessness. I do want to say that uh, important to recognize that all municipalities within uh, British Columbia, frankly across Canada, must always balance their budget. Uh, they are not allowed to run a deficit, uh, it, much like provincial and federal governments, and they could probably learn from us uh, if they actually paid attention to that, that you're not allowed to run a, a deficit. And that's why you're always faced with a little bit of options of property tax increases or looking for cuts to services. You do, and you are allowed, to debt. And as someone said, um, you don't borrow money to buy clothes and food, uh, but you definitely make sure that you invest your money when you buy house or capital equipment. We do have debt which we incur to pay for those capital infrastructure things. We were fortunate as we move forward and as we said to the Blue Bridge process that we had debt, a major debt paid off and that allowed us to increase or borrow $49 million without increasing the debt or the cost, sorry, without increasing the cost of servicing the debt. Our next opportunity if we need to borrow for a large infrastructure will come in about 2017. Uh, these are things that we need to get out communicate with the public and say, which are the most important projects that we need to move forward on? Are we going to look to uh, rebuild, replace, or refurbish? Those are conversations that we look forward to having with you over the next three years. Thank you. First lady at the mic, please. Hi there. Paul Brown, I, uh, I read in your platform that you feel that homelessness should be actually displaced into higher levels of government, and I find that a bit concerning. So I'm wondering if all of the uh, candidates, and Mr. Fortin, if you can speak to whether you actually support city council's endeavors to, uh, to provide affordable housing and to fight homelessness, and whether you do, in fact, feel that it's not particularly the city's problem or whether you feel it should be displaced to higher levels of government. This, this could be either Mr. Fortin or Mr. Philip um, it is all levels of government's responsibility, but unfortunately, they're downloading. So they're dumped it on us, and if we don't do something ourselves, the, the problem will continue to, to fester away. We spend approximately $55,000 per year per homeless person without giving them any sense of shelter. That's leaving them on the sidewalk. That's what it costs. If we can move them into um, assisted living if they have problems, that's only $28,000 a year. So that's a huge savings right there. And most people don't need assisted living, they just need regular accommodation, and that can be as cheap as $10,000 a year. So there's a huge amount of cost savings, and it's also the right thing to do. Um, the street crowd has had to take the city to court, and they won in BC Supreme Court, proving that the services that the city was providing were unreasonable. And that is, if you went in there to go to sleep, you'd get robbed. You'd be so jam-packed in there, you could catch diseases. And this makes people choose to stay outside. So the judge struck down our camping uh, bylaw, our non-camping bylaw, so gave people permission to camp in the streets or in the parks. Now, under my interpretation of that rule, if you have civic rights to shelter in the nighttime, well then you have civic rights to shelter in the daytime. And Dean Fortin appealed that case, tried to win the right to treat ho bad or ho poor people badly, and he lost. He couldn't get that at night added on. And yet they still have a daytime camping ban, which I think is setting the city up for another class action lawsuit. We should do the right thing. We should take care of the people who have fallen between the cracks. It's cost saving, it's human saving, and it's community saving. You'll notice the vacancies downtown. There's a lot of shops that have just given up trying to run a business downtown because there's too many problems. And it's time that we stood up and, and fixed those problems. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, and, and you know our downtown is still fragile as we go through a very, very slow economic recovery. But I will say this, it's been exciting to see more and more businesses opening the shops in their downtown. Uh, go downtown Gov uh, Douglas Street and you'll see more and more of those shops that had been empty, they're now being full. In fact, we're quite excited that if you actually go down in Johnson Street that you're going to see a food market opening there. Um, it's exciting to see the vitality that's coming back to our downtown. It is fragile. It's something we're really going to have to spend some time over the next three years to make sure we succeed. Um, homelessness has been one of our highest priorities. Affordable housing and homelessness has been our big priority over the last three years. And with our partners in the Coalition to End Homelessness, we've housed more than 1,500 people. And the City of Victoria, by going out and investing $2 million, 
um, has helped leverage more than $80 million from private sector, from public sector, from other levels of government to create all those units and move forward. And perhaps one of the great things that we really got a chance to do is we did an analysis and we found that we could jump in and buy two travelers in. And we spent $6 million to buy two travelers in. We then got money from our provincial government, two and a half million dollars. We've got money from the CRD who was kicking into this, uh, another million plus uh, from the federal government. In the end, the city of Victoria is putting about $1.2 million into housing. We immediately opened up 36 units for the support of housing for the hard to house and are working with the Native Friendship Centre, uh, taking longer than we expected, to get the other one open. But in the end, we got supports from the senior levels of government. And I know some people will say, well, that's still all the same tax dollar. But I think we need to recognize that the federal government and the provincial government wasn't going to give us a tax break. They were going to go spend that in somebody else's community. We should be proud that we are able to deliver those housing units here into this city for the hardest to house. Thank you. Was there, was there a question in the back? I think that gentleman down there is. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear from Paul didn't answer that one. I'm Brown. sorry. My mistake, Mr. Brown. Dean, I, I disagree with you. I live downtown. I don't think it's coming back. In fact, I'm seeing more empty spots. As far as the question, I agree. I mean, it was admirable that the city jumped in. The, the province should have been there, and they weren't. And the city jumped in, and I think that was marvelous. And I would have done the same. I'll tell you right now, I would have done the same. Um, the Traveler's Inn. We spent between 6 and $8 million. Hard to get the exact figures right now. And yes, we got money from the feds, and we got money from the province, and we got money from the CRD. The net result of six to eight million dollars is we are housing 36 people. That works out to just over $200,000 a person. We've got one traveler's in that is boarded up because the initial budget for fixing it was 400,000. It's now four million. That's why it's not going ahead. And I can tell you. The feds and the province are not happy with their investment because they look at it and they say, $200,000 plus per person, that's not a good deal. We need to get better value for money. I mean, we're into the homeless situation. We've got to get better value. That stinks. And in terms of the private sector, you've, you've seen articles in the paper where the city is turning down private sector operators who want to bring low-cost housing, and the city turns it down. Abominable. Pandora Green, $500,000 to, to upgrade the Pandora Green. We could have resodded it for 10000 and put the rest of the money in our place. I want to get better value for money. That's what I want. Thank you. Gentleman, gentleman at the back, please. Go first if you wish. Oh, sure. Well, you know, in the last three years, we've been excited for some of the opportunities that we've been able to bring forward. Probably most notably, if you're from Vic West, you'll you'll be aware of the wing building uh, that we were able to help with BC uh, with BC Housing and with nonprofits to purchase that building and open up. Uh, I think it's like uh, 49 or 50 units uh, for what I will call the working poor and for families. One of the things we want to move forward is we recognize we do need to build a town where, where, where young people can stay. Um, how do they you know, get them jobs that they can afford to pay for uh, living here, make sure that there's affordable housing. So we're looking forward to bringing in a new program. It's called the Short Term Incentive for Rentals. How can we get market rentals, rentals that will uh, rent for, for they're private, but they rent for 10 or 15 percent below average rents. How do we make sure that we can get more market rentals in this town so people who are just starting to start a career or start a family can afford to live here and invest in this community? We're excited about the opportunities. There's many more and we look forward to bringing them forward and we want to keep the momentum going on the affordable housing file. It's been something that uh, we've been able to move forward on and we look for, for new opportunities. Thank you. I have a Different idea. I don't think increasing housing or rental stock is really what people want here in Victoria. 63% of the population of Victoria rent. 
Uh, my plan is to facilitate um, a program where we encourage people to come together in small groups. Right? They're already living uh, five to six people in a house now to try and make ends meet. So we find a couple people who are paying way too much for their accommodation. They're already paying enough for a mortgage. We help them remove the barriers to owning a home. We get them a house. Now they're paying their rent becomes their mortgage, and now they're getting equity in their house. So a small cooperative group, three to five or six people, we give them, we change bylaws to allow them to have higher density in that building, and then we facilitate the changes that that um, house needs to accommodate their needs. Now this gets them into equity building relationship with their housing, and this is something all homeowners take for granted. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and when, if someone wants to leave that cooperative, they would have to sell their share either on the market rate or back to the city, and then the new person moving in would then start from zero again and start building up their equity. This is um, a really quick and easy way to help people get onto a track where they start building equity in their future. Because people are being held in rental traps for far too long in Victoria. It's a very expensive market, and we're already covering the, the amount for a mortgage. So um, it just makes sense to have this program created for the majority of Victorians who are the renters. If only they would vote for it. Well, um, as far as affordable housing, I, you know, I look at all of these expensive condos that have been developed over the last few years, the Humboldt Valley. Uh, they get quick approvals, but boy, a private developer comes forward uh, proposing affordable housing along Douglas Street at an old traveler's inn, and he's going to fix it up, and he's turned down. Um, and it's, it's far beyond the standard that the city's own traveler's inn is at, which I would categorize as slum, slum housing. I think what we need to do is encourage more affordable housing uh, in the city and get away from the expensive stuff that there were, we're so quick to approve. There was a rental project, affordable rental project along Fort Street that the uh, city council turned down not too long ago. That was affordable housing. There's a proposed affordable housing project along Burdett, where I live. Talk about having to go through hurdles to try and get this to the market. Um, I'll tell you, a big part of affordable housing is taxes. I don't know how many of you are feeling the pinch. Our taxes, residential taxes, went up 7% this year. That's not affordable. You're tripling the rate of inflation. Dean, on your brochure, I noticed, let's keep the momentum going. I want to stop the momentum. I want to stop the momentum of higher taxes, of greater debt of surprises come from City Hall, and I see sustainable here. I want to see this city become sustainable financially, where people can actually afford to live here. Thank you. Thank you Mike, please. Hi. Um, my name is Sarah. I have a question. Um, I have a question, and I'd like to direct it towards the current mayor, Dean Fortin. Um, I personally feel that council has made some important steps towards addressing homelessness and getting shelters in place. And I'd like to know what your plan would be to end homelessness in Victoria and if you think there is a way to get everyone in a home. Sure. That's a big one. Thank you for that question. Um, more of the same. You know, we've really had an opportunity to create some affordable housing. We've just finished uh, three big projects with the, the province, which is the Rock Bay Landing, which is a 90-unit emergency shelter as well as 27 um, units of so what we call transition housing. We just uh, the other day officially opened uh, Humboldt uh, Street, and that's uh, 50 units. Well, actually, it's 43 units of housing, but with 50 people in it. Supportive housing, taking people from streets to homes. And then we've uh, just about finished the project, hopefully in the next uh, two or three months, that the old Kool-Aid downtown becomes they add another 27 units of supportive housing so those units will come online in the spring which will be fantastic we're now at the stage where we need to go out and find the next three projects working with the province and the federal government saying what are the next three projects that we can bring on I suspect that um, you know that we can end street homelessness we have a 10-year plan we're now in year three I think we can finish it before then we're not going to solve addictions we're not going to solve mental health issues and we're not going to solve home or, or poverty 
but I think we can end homeless. And whether you see it as a moral issue or an economic, economic issue, much as is highlighted by the other candidates of how much it costs to keep someone homeless, that you recognize that there's a great opportunity to help people when you get into homes. And let me go to give you an example. I've still got a few seconds left. Um, we helped the 43 hardest to house in all of Victoria. We put them together with our ACT teams um, and we took those 43. And those 43 people were responsible for 6,000 police calls in the last five years, 1,000 in the last year alone. And we got them into housing. Housing was supports and the number of police calls dropped to 273 instead of 1,000. And the hospital visits, emergency ward hospital visits, we also tracked those, dropped to 60%. So whether you're worried about getting your own health care and your hip replacement and all of those issues, or whether you're actually worried about how we can provide quality of life for those less fortunate, we know that providing housing with supports is the answer, and we look forward to signing the next memorandum agreement with the province to bring uh, help to our homes. Yeah, my view is a little different there. I don't think the city's been doing enough. Um, and it's particularly around the issue where they had to take the city to court and they won their rights to, um, to have reasonable services here in Victoria. Now, the city has left people in the park. So you're allowed to set up your tent and they'll come in and break it down for you in the morning, motivate you on your way. Now, I think that's really the wrong thing to be doing. We should set up an area with proper supports cooking facilities, washroom facilities, shower facilities, laundry facilities, and then have a small group of people um, be in that, that area. There is a model of this called Dignity Village working in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is, is, is a very advanced society. They're really doing the right thing in North America. They're the only model where um, they're really taking care of their homeless people. Um, there's homeless in every city in North America. It's an epidemic. So we have to start addressing it like it's not going to go away because it's not going to go away. And housing first is a wonderful thing. But like he says, it's a 10-year plan. That leaves people outside for 10 years until they get their housing first plan. You know, that's ridiculous. By that time, 10 years of life on the street, they're not going to be recovering very easily. Right? So we need to make small, manageable tent villages where the people manage themselves. They form their own um, uh, boards of directors and they manage it themselves. If people don't fit into the camp, they're evicted from the camp. So this is a cost saving, human saving and community saving um, uh, uh, opportunity for us and we should be embracing it. These people are our citizens, their grandparents fought just as hard as ours did in World War II. So it's no time to cut them out now. You know, Dina and I actually agree on this because I think there is tremendous savings from doing this. Uh, and it's not just savings, I mean, compassion counts. Um, I favor safe injection sites. Uh, it makes sense, it shows compassion. Um, the studies all show it makes sense. The Supreme Court has ruled for it. Um, and, you know, it, it actually saves money. What I'm arguing is the status quo in terms of how we're dealing with the homeless problem cannot continue to exist. It's not working. Yes, it's working in some areas, but we've got to do better. We can get a lot better value for the dollar than spending eight, 68 million on the Travelers Inn to house 36 people. We can do a lot better. And I think the federal government, the uh, provincial government would say much the same. We really can't rely on the status quo. We've got to improve upon what we're doing. We've got to look for value for money. Being compassionate is great. But don't just throw the money away. Make certain you're getting good value for the dollar. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here, did you have a question, sir? Um, we, we've heard a lot about the uh, financial situation in Victoria. The reason for this to me is, is fairly obvious. We are supporting New Blue Bridge, which is a regional facility. We support the large arena for the region where well-attended concerts and ice hockey teams play. We support Beacon Hill Park and the flower baskets which bring in the tourists. We support the uh, theatres downtown. And we have uh, 350,000 people, of which we number 70,000, uh, taking advantage of these uh, facilities which we all need in the city of this site. We also support a police force which has the highest caseload per officer in the whole of the province. 
while one of our neighboring police forces has one of the lowest case loads per officer. My question is, which mayor, the day after they're elected, will make an appointment with the Solicitor General or the Premier or whatever minister is concerned and say, this is unsustainable, we need to be amalgamated, it's the only way it will ever be done through the provincial government. So either Paul or Steve now has an opportunity to go first. That's a monster question. It's a monster issue. Listen, I'll tell you right now, I support amalgamation. If I could do it tomorrow, I'd go ahead with it. No ifs, ands, or buts. But I don't want to promise you something I can't deliver on. What I will do in terms of amalgamation is move forward on amalgamating services with other municipalities. I think we've got an excellent opportunity with regard to garbage. Most of our workers are about to retire. Most of the trucks need replacement. I want to go to the, four core, the other three core municipalities and say, let's throw our marbles in together on this one. We can do it a lot more co uh, cost effective together. As far as um, the, the, the regional issues, I agree. We're paying the load for policing far more than we should. And we're paying much more for homelessness. We're carrying the load on homelessness, and we shouldn't. The other municipalities should be throwing in on this. What I want to say to uh, LRT, Dean Fortin says LRT is his number one issue. That's what he wants to move ahead on. I say LRT is going to benefit the Western communities and Saanich much more than we are. We've got a transportation problem. We've got to deal with it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I question whether an LRT is necessary. I will go to Saanich and the Western communities and say, you know what? You have an issue with regard to transportation. It's your regional issue. It's not ours. If you expect us to come to the table to deal with your regional issue on transportation, you have to come to the table on our regional issues, such as policing such as homelessness, because right now we're carrying the lion's share. And as far as Esquimalt, I will go to Barb Desjardins, and I will plead with her to stay with us. I will not give away the bankroll on it. I do expect her to pay properly in terms of policing. But do remember, we do have higher policing costs, partially because we have a lot of revenue that this city generates from being the entertainment district. So if we're going to give away or expect them to pay part of the cost, we're going to have to reflect the fact that we get a lot of revenue from the bar scene at night. So you get, it's complicated, but I do want to deal with it. And I want to deal with amalgamation. Thank you. Yeah, I'll differentiate myself from the other two candidates here because I don't think amalgamation is very forward thinking for us to be doing. One of our biggest concerns about um, our government right now is lack of accountability and lack of access to real information. Now centralizing our government will make it harder for us to do that, a larger bureaucracy to get to and uh, they'll have, it'll, be, it'll just be, be di more difficult. Right now there's 350,000 people in Victoria, there's 91 elected officials. That's not too top heavy. You know, I went around in, um, in before 2008 and did a survey on the streets. And 85% of people I surveyed couldn't name one city councillor in Victoria. So it's not because we're, we're too top heavy or we need amalgamation. It's because we're not interacting with each other. We don't have a vibrant democracy here. So my plan to go the opposite way than amalgamating, and that is empowering the community centers to be their own little democracy centers, to em encourage their um, citizens to get more involved with residents with relevant information, and when consensus arrives on an issue, bring it forward, and only a fool would say no to that, right? No one at City Hall is going to resist an organized community when they want something, because they'll be elected or voted out the next time around. So let's build our community centers, let's build our democracy. We have a challenge in front of us. The CRD is our regional um, operating board. Let's get more from it. We pay $80 million into it every year, but what are we getting out of it? Okay, if we have, we have comp complaints about things that are happening on a regional basis, the CRD is where we should be going with that. 
Thank you very much. And amalgamation is a large issue. And if you ever survey the population, I think that the stats show that 80% of the people in the city of Victoria favor amalgamation. Uh, drops to about 70% in Saanich and probably about 55% in Oak Bay. But truly, I think it's a reflection that the citizens in the region would like to see us amalgamate services. Unfortunately, um, there is difficulty in making that happen. And as you indicated, it is a provincial responsibility. I think the only way we're really going to do that with the province. I do remember meeting with the uh, former mayor of uh, Victoria when I was a councillor and others, and we went and saw someone and said, you know, we need to start looking at amalgamating police services. Uh, and what that minister said was, it's just going to get uh, my members uh, unelected if I do, uh, so it's not going to happen. So uh, I understand that it's going to be difficult, whoever is at the province, to really uh, pull the trigger and bring us all in. I think I want to focus though on a couple of things, and, and one of the things we do need to do, I, I love the garbage issue, but we need to understand that Sandwich just gave a 5% tax increase through the QP, so I don't think we're going to save any money if we amalgamate around garbage on that. Um, that we take a look at and say, over the last three years, some of the things that we've done is said, where can we find movement? So we brought forward a motion and moving BC Transit into the CRD, so everybody in the region will be part of the BC Transit system as well as regional planning. That's an important move forward. We've also brought forward a motion to say we want the CRD to determine collectively our top five priorities in infrastructure funding so our federal and provincial government can't dodge and use us against us. If we can agree on those top five, then we're all working together. And you know, for the first time ever, the City of Victoria and the City of Saanich had a joint council meeting. And we sat down and said, let us identify those things that we can work on together so we can start making sense of this region. So until the province is ready to do something, I want to say that this council has done a lot of work to move closer to try to accomplish the goals that you would like to see. Thank you, sir. Good question. To the mic again, please. I would just like to ask each of the three candidates what they will do to increase the number of bike lanes and generally encourage people to get out of their cars and to cycle a lot more. Sure. Yeah, I do believe in investing in cycling um, infrastructure, more bike lanes. Um, it's the old adage, if you build it, they will come. So let's make it easier for people to use their bikes. Uh, we should also subsidize our buses more, so because it, right now it costs as much to ride the bus as it does to take your car somewhere. So that seems a little ridiculous. We should make more incentive for riding the bus. But um, encouraging um, biking, we should have uh, more better lockup facilities in town and a, a place where you can get changed and have lockers so people can ride into work and then get changed so they can um, get to work and, and be all cleaned up and ready for it. So I, I do believe in that. Thank you. Um, I think one of the most exciting things that I've seen downtown has, has been the, um, the bike parking in front of Mountain Equipment Co-op. Uh, really a, a covered bike parking. Isn't it nice to see that? We've done a couple of tests, uh, sort of ones will it work in front of uh, Johnson Street, one down in Park Aids. Um, it's really exciting to say what we can do. For those that don't know, 16% of all of Victorians commute by bicycle. It's really important. It's one of the great things that we can do to stay healthy, great things to reduce greenhouse grasses. So we're going to commit it and we're going to continue to commit to bike lanes, making sure that there's shower facilities available, making sure that there's more lockups in buildings that, uh, uh, as they're getting built. There's so many things and incremental things and substantive things that we can do to increase bike uh, traffic in this town. Ultimately, we recognize that when you put bike lanes on, whether it be on the Johnson Street Bridge, um, to make sure that that's pedestrian and bicycle friendly, whether you put, when you put bike lanes on roads, it slows traffic down and calms it. It also makes it safer and makes it easier for people to get to and from work or just as a, a, a um, recreational thing. So bikes are exciting. It's something I do every day um, and uh, would encourage uh, those that can to also think about biking. It really makes for a sustainable and livable city. Thank you. We're just about at the time that we said we were going to close. However, our candidates have kindly agreed. I don't think Paul's answered on bike lanes. Okay. Our candidates have kindly agreed to stay on and take a few additional questions. And now we'll let Paul answer that last question. I, you know, I don't have uh, a lot more to add. I certainly support it. I mean, you know, when you look at the intercourse city, uh, we have tremendous advantage that we can cycle pretty much everywhere. So the encouragement of cycling within and throughout the city of Victoria makes a lot of sense. I mean, you really got to appreciate these people that, that actually cycle from the Western communities. Wow. Um, we have an infrastructure deficit or gap of half a billion dollars. So for me to say, um, when I'm mayor, uh, will I put money into the cycling? Um, 
I'd like to see what else is in that gap. Half a billion dollars. Sewers, roads. Uh, we know the crystal pool is in jeopardy. We have a fire hall that is not going to stand up to a decent quake. Um, we need to see a list of infrastructure projects. And we were promised that following the Johnson Street debacle, that we wouldn't be faced with any more surprises. We need to see that list. We still haven't seen that list. It was actually Open Victoria that forced out the fact that the city had been sitting for two years on a report that the fire hall was in trouble. It was Open Victoria that forced out the fact that the crystal pool is in trouble. Dean will argue they knew about it. Well, if they knew about it, why weren't they planning to replace it? We've got an infrastructure gap. I want to deal with the cycling. I want to deal with a lot of stuff. I'm not certain what all we have to deal with. Thank you. Gentlemen at the back, please. Hello, uh, my name is Aubrey Burke. I'm from the Ministry of Casual Living in Fernwood. We've been recently evicted, as well as collective works in Fernwood. Uh, this is a trend, what we feel towards gentrification. We moved into Fernwood when it was slightly more sketchy, and now as it's risen up, we've been pushed out. What are you guys doing um, for local grassroots and arts in Victoria? I'll start. I'll start on that. I, I think <laughs> we got to get a handle on the cuts, um, grants to community health or grants to community organizations such as the art. The budget this year cut 40 percent. The city's in financial trouble. Realize it. I mean, it's the same with infrastructure. In fact, this is from the uh, operating budget uh, PowerPoint this year uh, for the city. Read it. The status quo is not sustainable. The city is in financial trouble. I don't know why there's not more focus on this. Either you're afraid to deal with it, or you want to ignore it and hope it's going to go away. It isn't going to go away. So in terms of what I would do, I would do everything I could to restore those grants. But right now, we're in serious financial trouble. And we're not going to be able to deal with a lot of the social issues unless we get our financial act in order. It's serious. Thank you. I'm a community activist now, so as mayor, I would do the best to run the city as, to the best of my ability in an open and accountable may, way, but I would also make sure that uh, community activist groups and um, art communities are supported in our community centers. So that there's a space for people to have dialogue, to get their information out, to raise awareness, and to um, build more um, cohesive movements behind uh, these different issues. There's so many issues that our city is dealing with or that the people in our city are dealing with that we should all know about, right? The media does nothing for us except tell us where to go shopping, okay? So we need to really challenge the media. We need to create and invest in independent medias and we need to invest in, in local groups that, that challenge in the status quo because we need change here in Victoria. We certainly do. <clears throat> Thank you, and, and I do want to uh, just uh, put some information straight. The City of Victoria has made no cuts to the uh, arts. Uh, we have made no cuts to community uh, centers and community things. We hold those as very important to us, and we've maintained those throughout. Um, we're really proud of the support that we've been able to do for arts, and we'll continue to. Um, he's wrong. Sorry. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Whether it be uh, you know supporting McPherson Theater, whether it be supporting the Royal Theater, where it's uh, grants to all of the arts groups. You know we do that. We support the Poet Laureate. We have special projects grants. We think that the arts are really important for defining us who they who we are in the community, and we continue to support those. We also provide tax grants or, or uh, grants in lieu of paying payments for taxes uh, to a lot of the arts organizations in town. I think it's important for us. It's something we're continue to do and it's something we have great pride in. Thank you. Back to the mic, please. Thank you to all the candidates for taking the time to answer our questions. Uh, my question is about youth involvement. I'm curious, what initiatives would you take as mayor to involve youth in uh, municipal politics? Uh, one thing that um, I've, I've talked about with other Greens is to lower the voting age for um, civic elections. People in high school 
can um, become more aware of an election if they're actually going to be able to vote in it. Uh, and it is their future that it's uh, going to affect, right? A lot of people who are young, they don't vote. And I think it's because they don't really see the point in it because nothing's ever changed for them. So that's what, another reason why I'm trying to stimulate people to start thinking about affordable housing because the majority of renters in Victoria are very young people and it's, it's up to them to stand up and demand their rights. Also, you can encourage people to, you know, put, put relations in with where you see skateboarding is so illegal because young people don't vote. If everyone who was young voted, then we'd have more flexible rules around skateboarding because they would be a voice. Right? But my main idea is to lower the voting age uh, for municipal elections to help people get in while they're still in school so that the teachers can facilitate the education around what they need to be uh, learning about and get them involved early. And we know that when you catch people early, they continue on. So um, I think that would be a really good and useful way to get the youth to be voting. Uh, thank you. Um, great question. Um, and the reason why I think I, I like it a lot is one of the things that I got to do as a counselor was working with uh, citizens, working with uh, young people. We created the, the City of Victoria Youth Council. And it's a council of youth that meet, talk about the issues that have been really important to them. And each year they come and do an, import, uh, an important presentation to City Council and say, we need you to know this information. So whether it be late night bus services, greater bus services, whether it be issues around being gay or transgendered and, and how we represent that in the city and how we can make it a more friendly city um, or when we have really substantive things uh, that we need to talk about. We had them engaged on the official community plan. We had them engaged around the Blue Bridge. We went and talked to them because we recognized that that's an important voice that we need to have uh, out for our city. We also support uh, the lowering of the voting age. We try to get cool. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but we have phone apps so that people can now on their phone download an app and know where to vote and how to vote and, and uh, get part of the city of Victoria. We're advocating strongly for get polling stations at colleges and universities. So we also agree that if you can get someone to vote early, that they will maintain that habit uh, throughout their whole uh, lifetime. That allows us to get up higher than that 27% that vote right now. And you know, part of our official community plan was youth engagement. So get out of City Hall, don't do the come downtown and, and we'll just have an open house. You know, we went out and we talked to 600 students and it was kind of cool because one guy stood up and I said, what do you want in your city? And he said, more skate parks. And I said, are you going to use that in 30 years? And he paused for a moment and he said, no, but my kid will. And I said, yeah, now you're thinking about what your city's going to be and what it's going to look like. But, uh, let's keep youth engagement. Thank you. Uh, you know, going last makes it easy because you've heard what everybody else says, right? So, um, but I, you know, I tend to agree with a lot of the things Dean uh, has shared today, and I've heard him share them before, so this is not off the top of his head. He, he is talking with sincerity on this. Um, we need to get young people involved. There's no doubt about it. Um, and it's not just at the, the municipal level. It's at the provincial, the federal level. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know why youth aren't getting involved. You know, my nieces, my nephews, um, they're not voting, you know, and, and they're not, it, it, the voting is, is part of it, but more so, they're not engaged in the issues, and they just don't seem to be paying attention. I don't know how we engage them. I think Dean has some good ideas there, um, but we've got to engage them somehow, because if we don't engage them, uh, they certainly aren't going to vote, okay? So, thank you. Good question. Over here. Uh, count, uh, as part of the uh, initiatives around housing homelessness, uh, the council has been working on a uh, on a garden sweep policy, and I'd like to ask the candidates uh, what they have to say about that. Mr. Horton, it's your opportunity to go first if you wish. Paul always says he ends up last. You go first, Paul, and then I'll come last. I don't mind. I, 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 <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Um, I've seen a few where it has really irritated the neighbors, um, where people who uh, do not live in the city but own the property see it as an opportunity to optimize their income from it. And I sympathize with the neighbors. I certainly do. 
Um, it is a, an innovative approach in terms of trying to create affordable housing, but I don't think it's going to amount to a hill of beans, to be honest with you. There are very few people that are going to do this, and it seems that a lot of them that are doing it are absentee landlords who are simply trying to optimize or maximize the revenue from their property. So for those of you that are concerned about this, I don't think you're going to see a lot of these. <laughs> Um, it's cracked up more than it is meant to be, but I sympathize with those who, you know, are going to find it go next door. So. Yeah, I too would think that there's um, a very limited um, amount of places where um, these things could actually work. So it's not really a, a huge tool in um, in creating options for for affordable living. Uh, and the other thing too is it's again it's a program designed to subsidize landlords. Right? We need to start helping our young people get a stake in their future. So I want to see more programs that help them get equity in their buildings. Right? Um, if you form a cooperative and have a bunch of people move into it, that takes people out of the rental market at the highest end. And that should start to lower the rent for everybody as landlords start to recognize that their high rents are going to cost them because they're going to lose their tenants and they're going to have to lower their rents. I've met a lot of people on the street who have very good uh, landlords that don't charge them too much. But unfortunately, I've met far more people that are just paying through the teeth to live here month by month. You know, one, one young lady spends 1400 bucks for a basement suite with one bedroom in it. She's got no life. Right? And this is our, this is our future that we're, we're strangling by ho holding people in these rental traps. So we need to create the programs for the majority of citizens who are the renters, get them into affordable living that gets them equity or else they really don't have a future and that's not a very good situation to be in for the majority of our citizens. Uh, thank you. Um, I like the questions. Uh, I like garden suites in the right place at the, at the right uh, uh, situation. This city council legalized secondary suites, uh, one of the first things we did. Uh, we even brought in an incentive to, uh, say, a $5,000 incentive. At that time, the economy was melting down. We recognized that the construction trades were in problems, uh, that if we can incent people putting in secondary suites and help the construction trades, that would be a good thing. Um, and secondary suites are great, and, and, and secondary suites and garden suites are slightly different in that secondary suites are combined within the within the, the unit that exists, whereas garden suite may be um, really the garage or the shed or, or, or the, the suite in the back, the granny suites, I think they're often called. It is a great way for seniors to stay and afford to live in their home. It is a great way for young people to be able to have an income to actually be able to buy their first home. Um, it's fantastic, and I wish my mother would do a secondary suite, because then there would be someone there to help cut her lawn, or if she falls, and then she falls on Monday, and I don't phone until Sunday, and she's in Kamloops, I don't know if she's lying there. Having someone there to check up on her is good. It is a great way to redensify neighborhoods, because let's remember, our neighborhoods used to have four or five or six people living in them. So it's a great way to redensify neighborhoods without eating up green space, for bringing kids and families back into our communities, making sure our community is fit for all. Garden suites little bit of difficulty around there because um, they are outside of the building that they can get too close to neighbors so we need to make sure and then we've set up the rules to allow that we will take a look at every garden suite to make sure that we can measure the impact on the community and neighborhood before we approve it. Thank you. I think we'll just take two more questions. I apologize if anybody's left at the mic. Our staff has very kindly stayed over time. We can't keep them any longer. Our candidates have also very kindly stayed over time. But at this point, I think we can just take two more questions, and that'll take us quite a bit into the longer than we said. Go ahead, sir. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris I'm a local business owner. Um, what I'm gathering tonight is that there's an incredible lack of financial transparency in this city. A lot of people here, a lot of people up there don't know the numbers. So perhaps it's time that the city hire an auditor that's responsible for relaying the, the, the numbers. And that's a third party person not working for any one of the people up there. Let's get an auditor. Let's get the numbers out here. How can anyone make a decision based on planning and moving forward in taxes if we don't have the figures? We're supposed to go uh, vote for one of you next Saturday, and we don't know what the, ta what the taxes are, what the numbers are, what we can pay for, what we can't pay for. Will any, any of you up there support an honor? Um, 
I, I think it's important to understand that uh, each year we get audited financial statements from an independent third party. KPMG comes in. Yes, we pay them, but they're independent. They uh, have to meet their professional standards and guidelines. And all of this information is there, and it's posted on the web. Um, and I should also highlight that the City of Victoria continues to, award, uh, to win awards for its financial uh, accounting. One of the things we've done over the last two years is recognizing that we're starting to see some of these challenges. And I've been out for the last 18 months talking about Crystal Pool and talking about our challenges around the uh, fire station and all the other challenges coming forward. Um, I've been to senior centers, I've been to cook centers, I've been to uh, Crystal Pool. We've been everywhere talking to people about saying, here's our challenges going forward. We need to engage you and hear from you about what we're going to do. Because we recognize that we've got good accounting systems, um, but ultimately we can't just keep increasing taxes. So all governments, you're faced with three basic choices, and then you can play within them. But you can increase taxes, you can cut services, or you can find new revenue. Uh, what we've heard when we've gone out and talked to people, and Mr. Brown's been part of that, he's, uh, I'm always surprised when he says, oh, it's us, we, we, we brought out this surprise. Yeah, we told you 18 months ago, and there you were at all the meetings, and there it is published in the paper a year ago. So to be saved, it's a, you know, the last minute surprise, and he brought it out. These are things we've been talking about forever. Um, we've been out there, and that's why we recognize that we have to bring in an economic development strategy. People don't want to see increasing taxes. Um, they're happy with the services that they want. Um, they don't want to see cuts to parks or recreation or cuts to roads or sewage or all of that. So it's about making sure that we can bring in more economic development that allows us to pay the bills and we can get more people paying, then that means that taxes don't have to rise as swiftly. Thank you. Um, it is true that the city wins awards for having the best financial policies. But so does every other city that spends the $600 fee to win that award. <laughs> That's right. That's true. And it's shocking. I don't think we need to hire an auditor. What we need to do is um, share the information. We have accountants at City Hall. We know the numbers at City Hall. They just have to start sharing those numbers. It is your information. It's a public office after all. Could you imagine all forming into one big cooperative and then having us four decide all the decisions for you guys and not tell you what we're doing? You'd be pretty upset, wouldn't you? Well, that's what we're doing at City Hall, right? That's what a PR team does, okay? It, it leads you to where you might not want to be going. And it helps you want to go there by changing your perspective on your way, okay? We don't need a PR team in Victoria. We need honesty. We need open government. So, and that's going to require you guys to go into your neighborhoods and find some people who aren't voting and bring them in and vote for change. Okay, my name is Steve Filipovic and I represent a real opportunity to cut the strings at City Hall and to get a genuine democracy functioning here in Victoria. And I would also recommend that you look into Ben Isett, Rose Henry, Lisa Helps, Shelley Goodyen, and I'll leave the last four for up to you guys. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as they say, for the last 10 months, I've been delving into the city's financials. And I'll tell you, you know, and I've had people who've worked at the highest level of the provincial government helping me. And we've had trouble making sense out of them. Um, but I'll tell you what, there are too many canaries that are falling over in the mine. There's something wrong. This city's in tough financial shape. As far as a, a municipal auditor, Yes, I would support that. They do work that is quite different than vetting that the books are accurate. The books are accurate. I don't dispute that. What they do is they get looking at value for money. Are we getting value for money? Are we doing good work? In fact, one of the things, and I have a 13-point action plan. It's on my website. These are 13 points I will do as soon as I get elected. 13 is unlucky, right? No. There are 13 things that need to be done, and one of them is to ask for an independent financial review of the city's financial affairs. I want to know what sort of position we're in, and I, I, I just don't know right now. We can spend the money better. And Dean, you talk about an economic development strategy. It's going to bring $16 million more revenue to the city. In these economic times, if you can just hold on to what you've got, 
you're doing real well. Where you're going to find $16 million more revenue? Uh-uh. I doubt it. Anyways, take a look at my action plan. Thank you. This is a two-part question for Mayor Dean Fortin and the other two. Um, the first part is, is with all these expenses coming up on infrastructure payments and stuff like that, I would like to know how close we are to our max debt servicing limits. And uh, I'd also like to know what the limit is and how you're going to go ahead and pay for those. Okay. Uh, let's understand our, our infrastructure challenges. So we have about a $1.5 billion uh, uh, infrastructure uh, challenge that we're going to have to come with up with over the next 20 years. We've invested and we're building up our infrastructure reserves and we're, we're putting forward and we have at least a billion dollars put in. Roads, sewer, water, all of those are taken care of. It's the big ones. It's the big challenge. You know, Crystal Pool. Do we fix it for $10 million? Do we um, build one for $27 million? Do we include our senior centers in it? Do we look at $48 million? This is one that we need to get out and talk to you. We need to get out and talk to you, or is it taken by priority for a new public library, a new downtown library? There are some big infrastructure pieces that go out there. We need to recognize that, um, that if we can get senior levels of government to get in and help fund these infrastructure challenges, then we know that we can meet them. Um, we have a policy and we have a commitment within the city of Victoria that we will not take on any new debt uh, that will lead to increases in taxes at this time. That's debt. I, I would just uh, so like that's, to, that's what to interrupt for a second. Sure. You guys asked us to get to, to, get to the question. Uh, I asked you, and I'll read it out again sure. exactly. Um, how close are we to our max debt servicing limits, and what is that limit? And this is legislated by law that you guys have to follow. Um, we have uh, a, there is both a legal answer and then there's both a political answer. And my legal answer is we have a lot of room that we can still borrow. I don't think politically that we want to increase taxes to borrow more debt. What is it? That's my question. What is our debt servicing level? What is the max, and where are we at? How much can more can we borrow? Sure. Well, what? So, this is frustrating. How close are we to our max debt servicing limits, and what is that limit? Um, I don't have those details on me. I can get the answer for you from. You're, a you're the mayor, and you don't know how much we can spend and how much we have to go. He's answered yes, as, I do. as well I do, as he can. Thank you. Youth participation. <laughs> Um, We've got lots of room. It's just who wants to jack yeah, up the taxes to pay? I have looked at it. Um, I'm surprised you haven't. You're running the city. I have Did looked you at it. Did you ask him that, that question? Was that no, a... I didn't. I don't know the man. <laughs> I've never met the man before. And I... I did my research as a youth on the internet. Thank okay. you. <laughs> we are not there yet. Um, we're not, I would say, getting close. Um, so we still have a fair bit of elbow room. I mean, we could go out and borrow for the crystal pool, another 35 million, or uh, what is it, um, 50, 55 million for the crystal. We could do it, um, but I don't think most of us here uh, can absorb that sort of hit. We, you know, we increased our, our debt carrying costs this year uh, 129%. Um, Dean's right, you know, we've got about a half a billion dollar gap, and that gap is growing at about $10 million a year. I don't like thinking of the crystal pool as a non-essential. We need a recreation center in this city. I think one of the things we do is we go to the Y and we say, you know what, your facility is getting old. Why don't we throw our marbles in together and create one class facility that maybe has a class library in it? I'm not saying that's, that's going to work, but I think we need to start thinking outside of the box. And to think that other levels of government are going to help us out of this, uh-uh. They're in tough financial shape as well. Don't kid yourself. And in terms of amalgamation, if we're going to get the others to join with us, we're going to have to get our financial act in order because Saanich looks at us as being real ugly financially. They don't want to share our burden right now. Thank you. Well, I have some thank yous to make. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Fairfield Gonzalez Community Association 
and the Parent Advisory Committee of Sir James Douglas School for helping us sponsor this event, and also Missy Edwards, our staff person from the Fairfield Gonzalez Community Association, and Aubrey Burke at the back of the school district, and uh, as well, uh, Rick Schwartz, our timekeeper, other people who helped to organize the event very capably, Cornelia Lang and Blair Humphrey. Of course, all the candidates who came out this evening, we recognize how much you sacrificed for the opportunity to serve our community, and we really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you as well, and please remember to vote and ask your friends and neighbors to vote next Saturday, November 19th. If anybody would like to help to uh, organize the chairs and fold them up, thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks to Sid, Thanks to Sid too, eh?